We've previously demonstrated the various controls of the airplane, with the exception of the throttle, which varies the power output of the engine. We're not attempting to give you a course in the theory of aerodynamics, but some understanding of the engine's job may help you in your flying. For instance, the power plant of any ground-borne vehicle produces forward motion simply to take you where you want to go. But the power plant of an airplane produces forward motion, first of all, to make the airplane fly, and secondly, to take you where you want to go. Driving along a level highway in an automobile, if you close the throttle by taking your foot off the gas, you simply slow down and stop. In an airplane in level flight, if you cut off the power and hold the plane level, as soon as its forward motion falls below a certain speed, it will start to sink. An automobile going uphill is traveling in the direction its nose is pointing. But an airplane may have its nose pointed up in a climbing attitude and still be flying a perfectly level course, not climbing at all. In fact, the airplane may be in this attitude and actually be going down. Or it may be flying in perfectly level attitude and yet be steadily going up, gaining altitude. Previously, we stated that when the wing of an airplane is tilted up, it wants to go up. When it's tilted down, it wants to go down. That's true. It does want to do these things. But its ability to do them depends upon the power of the engine. Without power, no airplane can stay in the air very long. The pull of gravity makes it want to come down. And once it is down, makes it want to stay on the ground. Then there is drag, which tries to hold the airplane back. You can observe the effects of drag when you pull your hand through water. The faster you try to move your hand, the more the water tries to hold it back. Likewise, the air is constantly trying to hold the airplane back. To counteract the forces of gravity and drag, we have the power of the engine to pull the airplane through the air. This force is also referred to as thrust. As the power of the engine creates enough pull to overcome drag, the plane moves forward and the air passing over and under the wings creates lift, making them want to go up. The greater the forward speed, the greater the tendency of the wings to rise. So, whenever a plane has enough forward speed to create enough lift to overcome gravity, the plane will take off and fly. Whenever the force of lift is greater than the force of gravity, that starts the plane on an upward course gaining altitude. Whenever the force of lift is less than the force of gravity, that starts the plane on a downward course, losing altitude. Whenever lift and gravity are exactly equal, the plane will continue on whatever course has already been established, whether that be up or down or straight and level. So, a plane may remain in perfectly level attitude and still gain or lose altitude, depending upon the variations in power or pull, as it varies the plane's speed. However, the rate at which a plane gains or loses altitude is not determined by airspeed alone, but by a combination of airspeed and attitude. When the wings of a plane are tilted up, they want to go up. If at the same time there's plenty of power, they will go up. However, if you reduce the throttle, the wings still want to go up. But since there's not enough power to take them up quite so steeply, a compromise results and the plane goes up at a more shallow angle. So you see, the performance of an airplane depends as much on what you do with your throttle as it does on what you do with your stick and rudder pedals. And incidentally, since this is the case, keep your hand on the throttle as much of the time as possible, except when you're trimming the plane. When you're cruising along in straight and level flight, you'll carry roughly about one-third to one-half throttle. The tachometer on your instrument panel will tell you that the engine is turning over at the rate of 1,750 to 1,850 revolutions per minute, which is specified for cruising in this particular type plane. With the throttle at this setting, and the plane in approximately the level attitude, you should be able to maintain a level course without gaining or losing altitude. Now open the throttle to about the three-quarters position, and at the same time, ease your nose up to about here. This is the climbing attitude for this particular plane. In this attitude, the plane will travel upward at about this angle. Let's say that in this correct or most efficient climbing attitude, the plane would gain this much altitude in 10 seconds time. If you pull the nose
goes up any higher, say to about here, you decrease your airspeed, and although you might be climbing at a slightly steeper angle, you'd gain altitude more slowly. In 10 seconds, you'd be about here instead of here. If you drop the nose below the correct climbing altitude, say to about here, you would travel upward at this angle. Again, you would gain altitude more slowly. So the correct climbing attitude is that attitude in which you will gain altitude the fastest at the established climbing throttle setting. But keeping the plane in the climbing attitude is hard work. The stick keeps wanting to go forward because the nose doesn't want to stay up there. So once you have the nose in the desired position, trim the plane until all pressure is off the stick, making it easy to keep the nose where you want it. Now take a good look at the position of the nose in relation to the horizon. And notice the distance of the top wing and the broomsticks or spreaders above the horizon. Another cue to the correct climbing attitude is the sound of the engine. It's working harder than it did in level flight, but it still sounds all right. Pull the nose up too high, you can hear the engine begin to labor. And you can see and feel a slight vibration in the plane. If we let the nose sink below the correct climbing attitude, the engine will speed up. It takes a little time to speed up or slow down as the attitude changes. again as we bring the nose back up to the correct climbing attitude. And notice that the sound of the engine changes rather slowly. When we're ready to bring the plane back to level flight, we first ease the nose back down to the level attitude. Then a few seconds later, after the speed has had a chance to pick up a little, we bring the throttle back to the setting for cruising and trim the plane for straight and level flight. Next, let's find out about the glide. To enter a glide, we bring the throttle all the way back and ease the nose down. To about this attitude. Trimming the plane for the glide as soon as we have the nose where we want it. In the correct or most efficient gliding attitude, the plane will descend at approximately this angle. Suppose, for example, that we were attempting to glide into a field here from this point. Under normal wind conditions, let us say the correct gliding angle would put us comfortably within the limits of the field. But if we were to shallow out the glide, bringing the nose up, let us say to about here, we would reduce our forward speed, cutting down the lift, and we would come down at this angle. Instead of stretching the glide, bringing the nose up would shorten it. Chances are we'd undershoot the field, coming down about here. If, on the other hand, we were to steepen the glide, dropping the nose below the correct gliding attitude, we would descend at this angle, and at the same time, we would also build up excess speed. We would again run the risk of undershooting. So the correct gliding attitude is that attitude in which the plane will glide the furthest. So you see how important it is to get acquainted with the correct gliding angle. Notice the position of the nose below the horizon and the top wing, which is down much closer to the horizon. That's about the way the glide looks. Here's how it sounds. If the nose wanders up out of the gliding attitude, the sound quiets down. This looks wrong for the glide and sounds wrong. So bring the nose back down again to the correct attitude. gets down too low for the gliding attitude, you get a higher pitched hum in the rigging. Thus, you will soon begin to get the feel of the glide. But at this point, there are a couple of other things we need to know about the behavior of the airplane. Let's do some experimenting. First, seeing to it that our plane is trimmed up for straight and level flight. 
some planes, we have pointed out previously, can also be flown straight and level at cruising speed with feet off the rudder pedals. Such planes we speak of as being well rigged. Now let us once more simultaneously add throttle and ease the nose up smoothly into the climbing attitude. We trim the plane for the climb until it will remain in that attitude hands off. But now if we take our feet off the rudder pedals, the nose swings off or yaws to the left. This tendency of the plane to pull off or yaw to the left under certain conditions is sometimes referred to as the effect of torque. If we put the plane back into straight and level flight at cruising throttle, the tendency of the plane to yaw to the left again disappears. This is because the manufacturer has so rigged the plane that it more or less counteracts the yawing tendency when in straight and level flight at cruising speed. But if we cut the throttle and push over into a glide, there may even be a tendency for the nose to yaw slightly to the right due to overcorrection of the rigging built in by the manufacturer, although this will probably be very slight. But no two planes are exactly alike in this respect. Even though they may have come off the production line side by side, there are a hundred little variations which may cause minor differences in the rigging. But if every plane is different, how do you know how much rudder to use? You use whatever rudder is required to keep the nose from swinging off the course you want to fly. Pick a couple of points on the horizon and keep the plane right on that heading, being careful to keep your wings level. If the nose starts to pull over to the left, ease on a little right rudder pressure, just enough to bring the plane back on heading and keep it there. If it swings off to the right, you overcorrect. So ease off a little of that right rudder pressure, just enough to allow the plane to come back to the exact heading you want. But don't stare at the nose. Don't put on the blinders. Glance at the ground from time to time so you'll always know where you are. Keep the eyes busy. Use that roving gaze. Strangely enough, it's easier to keep the nose right on heading if you don't concentrate on it too hard. And whatever you do, keep your wings level, except when you're in a turn. If you fly with one wing low, you're doing one of two things. You're either turning, your nose is pulling away from your heading, or you're slipping. You're not in balanced flight, so always be conscious of the attitude of your wings. Now the next fundamental maneuver in the syllabus is the gliding turn. Starting from the gliding attitude, you simultaneously apply aileron and rudder. Then, once the turn is started, hold the degree of bank you've established using opposite aileron if necessary and relax whatever rudder pressure you added to start the turn. When you're ready to recover, apply opposite aileron and rudder in such a way that the nose stops moving at the same instant the wings reach the level attitude. Let's try another one. Perhaps the most difficult turn to get on to is the left climbing turn. In a straight climb, we've seen that you usually have to carry a good deal of right rudder to keep the nose on heading. So in entering a left climbing turn, ease off a little on your right rudder. If your rudder adjustment is correct, you'll get a smooth, well-balanced turn entry. If your nose moves too fast for the amount of bank you have on, you've probably eased off too much on your right rudder. If the nose stops or doesn't move fast enough, chances are you haven't eased off enough. But you'll be able to tell when you hit it just right by the smooth precision with which the plane enters the turn. Then when the turn is established, ease that right rudder forward again, replacing what you took off to start the turn. And hold your rate of turn, keeping that nose moving steadily and the same distance above the horizon throughout the turn. When you're ready to come out of the turn, you'll have to add even more right rudder than you've been carrying. In entering a right climbing turn, you begin with whatever right rudder you've been carrying in a straight climb, adding to this as much more right rudder as you need to start the turn. 
As soon as the turn is established, ease off that added right rudder at the same time you neutralize the ailerons. In recovering from the turn, instead of adding left rudder, simply ease off a little more on the right rudder. If you have trouble, experiment gently with your rudder pedals until the turn looks right and feels right.